Right, welcome in everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We will go ahead and get started in about a minute here. We'll give folks a, a few more minutes to join. I have a few more sips of coffee to get ready. <laughs> Kyle's still waking up? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a college student. You can't expect much Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome in everyone. I will go ahead and uh, get started with just introducing myself and then I will pass it over to Kyle to introduce himself. I'm Jason Wood. I am the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Anid. I was also diagnosed with an eating disorder and OCD back in the summer of 2020. And uh, since that time, I've been in recovery and I have been on a mission to get out there and to share my story to hopefully uh, break some of the stigmas and the stereotypes that exist around uh, mental health conditions, around eating disorders, and uh, to really speak about the relationship that I see uh, when it comes to my eating disorder diagnosis and uh, my OCD diagnosis. I was diagnosed with an unspecified eating disorder, which I've later realized was orthorexia. But um, it, it's really interesting to see how orthorexia and OCD really kind of played played off of each other to uh, make my life uh, pretty miserable for a long time. So uh, recovery and treatment has been uh, excellent at, in order to uh, to get my life back. But uh, that's a little bit more about me. I will pass it off to our awesome guest today, Kyle King, who is a mental health advocate and very active with the International OCD Foundation. Kyle, it's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Yeah, um, for sure. So I'll talk a little bit about myself um, and my experiences. Like Jason, I was diagnosed with OCD um, and uh, anorexia. Uh, so not exactly like Jason, but an eating disorder. Um, but I, my path seems to have been the other way around. I was first diagnosed as OCD, um, and the eating disorder came a bit later, um, like years later. Uh, but I'll start from the beginning. Why don't I? Or actually, I'll introduce myself first. Hi, my name is Kyle. I'm a college student right now. Um, I'm a senior studying neuroscience, and I'm hoping to go to med school next year. And I, I'm really interested in psychiatry because uh, mental health has, has really changed my life. It's, uh, <laughs> certain disorders have made my life really difficult at times. And, and in retrospect, um, they've given me a drive to, to share my story, to break stigma, and hopefully to help people struggling with the same stuff. Um, so I was first diagnosed with OCD when I was 13 in seventh grade. And me and my parents, uh, we we didn't know what was going on when it started. It, I, I was just kind of like your typical 13 year olds one month. And then really within within the, the time scale of a month, um, I just I fell off a cliff, it felt like um, I my initial fears were that if I touched a library book, I would get dirty. Um, and dirty, I don't really even know what it meant. I would just touch a library book and my hands would feel weird. Um, so I started avoiding library books and then I started avoiding things that library books had touched. And then I started avoiding whole bunches of other things in my world. Um, and very quickly I couldn't leave my room. Um, and, and my parents, uh, they thought, well, maybe this is psychosis. Maybe this is a whole number of disorders because they didn't really know what OCD was. Um, and I was taken to a therapist and, and she was like, well, this seems to be just general anxiety. And we talked about exposures a little bit. Um, but it wasn't for a couple of months after that, that I was diagnosed with OCD. And I began ERP. Um, so ERP, for those who aren't familiar, is exposure response prevention. It's a, a type of therapy um, that I, I know is used in the context of OCD. I don't know what other contexts it may be used in. But it's essentially doing the things you're scared of and resisting the urge to undo those things by a compulsion. Um, so I started doing ERP, and for the first six months that I was in that therapy, I really white knuckled it. Um, I didn't believe that it was going to work. I didn't want to face my scary thoughts that I was going to get dirty and contaminated. So I would do the exposures my therapist told me to do, and then I would either mentally tell myself that it was it was okay because X Y Z reason, um, or I would just wash my hands or or shower um, and not tell anybody about it. So I did that for a while and I got worse and eventually I hit um, my rock bottom, which is really where I, 
I just couldn't leave my house anymore. Like I, I was sitting, I couldn't wear any of my clothes. I couldn't touch my school books. I couldn't talk to my friends. And I just felt so isolated and alone that I decided, you know what, might as well give this therapy thing a shot. Um, so I actually started doing ERP and I gradually got better. It wasn't a linear incline, but eventually by the time I was in eighth grade, I got to a point where I didn't feel like OCD was a, a big deal in my life anymore. Um, so flash forward, I go through eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. And then in the summer before 11th grade, um, I, I had a difficult experience with a girl. Um, I was rejected, I'll be honest. Um, and I I thought like, okay, well, maybe I'll start going to the gym. And I, I kind of started going to the gym and I didn't think anything of it at the time. And I was like, okay, well, you know, this gym stuff, maybe I want to be a little bit healthier. So I started changing my eating habits a little bit. And over that summer, I I started to eat less. My goal was to gain weight. And my goal was to like look more muscular, um, but I wanted to be healthy. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start like eating only these specific foods. And I'm only, only going to eat like a certain quantity of these specific foods. And I want to go to the gym like seven times a week. And I want to be there for this length of time each day of the week. Um, and that's how it started. And it already starts pretty rigid. Um, and then as the summer went on, I started to eat less and less and less and eat only more and more and more specific things. Um, and then I started like noticing myself looking up like recipes online to see what was the lowest calorie version of something. Or I would like watch YouTube videos of other people eating because like I've never done that before in my life. And all of a sudden that seemed really interesting to me. Um, and I was just so, so tired. But I didn't think that it was a problem because society had told me that like eating healthy and working out was this thing that I should be doing. Like I should be, you know, watching my weight and, and only eating organic foods. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm doing everything right that way. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and then eventually towards the end of the summer, I realized like, you know, I'm, I can't think about anything but food. This kind of feels like OCD. Um, and I, I went to my parents I did some research first and I was like, you know what, this actually might not be OCD. This might be an eating disorder um, is what I decided in my head. And I didn't know what eating disorder it might be, but I went to my parents and I explained to them what was going on in my head. And they said, no, Kyle, I think that's just OCD. And I was like, well, it's about food. And that seems to be an eating disorder. And they're like, well, it sounds like OCD because you're obsessing about food and your compulsion is just not eating food. And I saw their point, but <laughs> when I read articles online about eating disorders, I could see how it could be an eating disorder too. So I was confused. Um, my parents took me to the therapist that had treated me for OCD in the past. And she said, you know, this is an eating disorder. And then we did, proceeded to treat it exactly as if it was OCD. Um, so we did a lot of exposure response prevention. And she just basically had me approach foods and do the behavior, which is to eat it. Um, and then try not to compulse by working out in any way. And, um, I, I did that treatment and I did that like very behavioral treatment. And I didn't focus a lot on what was going on in my head and the reasons that were leading to me to restrict. Um, and throughout 11th grade, I gained back a lot of the weight that I had lost. I felt like I was in a better place with food. Um, and Jason, stop me at any time if I'm going on too long. <laughs> no, no, keep going. Keep going. I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you you are doing an awesome job sharing your story. So thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I don't want to take up too much oxygen. Um, no. so I, I started gaining weight again. Um, and I, I got physically healthier. I was bradycardic. I really was like in a state of being physically unhealthy, um, or like on, on death's door really. And I, I was able to work with therapists and kind of get out of that. And towards the end of 11th grade, I was at a healthy weight and I felt like I had recovered from my eating disorder because I, we had approached it with this very behavioral mechanism, like where we were just eating food and like gaining weight and that was it. Um, and what now I kind of realize in hindsight was that that sort of like just straight up behavioral approach um, didn't really work for me, although I, I feel like it may be able to work for some people. I, I still had a lot of the insecurity and um, the lack of self-confidence that led me to start restricting in the first place. Um, 
pent up inside me and I guess I never really addressed it. So I had recovered from this eating disorder and I was maintaining my weight, but it was really because I had worked out this thing with my family where like I was, I was eating every meal with them practically and they were kind of helping me eat. And then I went to college um, and I was on my own. And <laughs> thank you. Um, then I went to college and I was on my own for the first time really in my life. And I didn't have my dad cooking meals for me and I didn't have my mom or to maintain my weight. Um, and I thought I was going to be fine because I had been maintaining my weight at my house for a year at that point. Um, but very quickly, I realized that that those AN thoughts crept right back into my head. And at the dining hall, I would have these thoughts that like, you know, you don't want to eat frosted flakes because they have all this excess sugar. Maybe you should just have like Cheerios, but not the honey nut kind because they might have too much sugar. Um, and it started pretty it felt like innocuous at the very least. Like I, I didn't think anything would come of it. I just started doing little restriction behaviors here and there. Um, and that progressed over two years until in junior year. So last year, um, I, I, I just bottomed out essentially. Um, my, my fears and, and all of these AN thoughts came rushing into my head and I started restricting again as, as strongly as I had previously because of all those insecurities that had led me to restrict in 10th grade kind of came to the top again. Um, and I, I lost a lot of weight and I, I became really physically unhealthy again. And I ended up taking the semester off and going back home. Um, and I stayed home for about six months and, and did really deliberate treatment with my parents um, and spent a lot of time thinking about what what leads, what led me to fall into these AN holes. Um, because when you're in it, it's really powerful. And, and I, I knew what I was doing wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. I knew only eating vegetables was really, really unhealthy for me, but I couldn't get myself to snap out of it by myself. And I, I felt so powerless. Um, and I went home and I, my, I, I told my parents all these things and they helped me begin eating again. And, and they kind of really in the, in the beginning, like forced me to eat certain quantities of food just so that I could feel like I, I feel like I had a whole brain again so that I could really, I wasn't always lethargic. And I, I could fight the A and thoughts. Um, and, and over the course of six months, I began to gain more and more weight. And I, I felt a little bit more confident in fighting the A and thoughts. Um, and yeah, I guess that's kind of where I am now. I'm, I'm back at school. Um, it was it was a long time that I was, I took a semester off. So I was home for about six months and I was doing a lot of deliberate treatment then. Um, and now I feel a lot more confident than I did when I first came here. And I, I thought I could uh, feed myself and I, and I thought that I was like, all set. Um, now, now I don't just think it, I know it. Like I know that I can feed myself. I know I can listen to my body cues. Um, and I know what Anne's tricks are and how to how to get out of uh, any Anne hole that I may fall into. Um, okay, that's, that's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And it was about this time last year that we connected for the first time that our paths crossed, um, I think. So it, it was one of those things where after I, I actually uh, spoke to the, the young adults group that Kyle leads at IOCDF, and uh, after I spoke, you reached out to me and said, hey, thanks for sharing your story. There were things that you shared that I could relate to or helped me better understand my story. And I have to say, just now listening to you share your story, it goes both ways. Because listening to you share your story, I was sitting here relating to so many of the things that you were sharing and and can better understand my own journey as well. So thank you. Thank you for, for, for sharing all of that. Uh, one of the things that stuck out to me is the feeling of being powerless. Like it's just got total control over you. And that's how it was for me too. Um, I could not do anything without thinking about food or thinking mm -hmm. about eating. Uh, I was convinced that even just one bite or run, one wrong decision when it came to food would completely contaminate my body. With orthorexia, yeah. it was one of those things where I had to eat the healthiest diet I possibly could. I wasn't as concerned about the quality of the food or the quantity of the food. I was more concerned about the quality of the food. And uh, like you mentioned, too, it, it had to be organic and it had to follow all these diet culture things. And it wasn't just a want. 
for me, it was a need. Like I felt mm-hmm. like I needed to do this. Otherwise, something bad was going to happen. I was going to get a disease or I, it was going to kill me. That's honestly what my mind was telling me. And yeah. I think it was that combination of OCD and, and orthorexia working in tandem there to convince me of that. Um, and it, it, I think in the case of my diagnosis, it was kind of like the chicken and egg, like which came first? Was was I already dealing with OCD before orthorexia came along or did they just kind of pop up at the same time? Mm-hmm. I can now go back and identify times from my childhood where I was dealing with those obsessions and the compulsions at a young age. It might have not been around food necessarily, but it was other parts in my life. And those things have carried with me, which makes me realize that, yeah, the OCD has probably been there since childhood. And then mm-hmm. at some point in my teens, it was the eating disorder that that evolved. And um, I would say at different times, I was probably, I leaned a little bit more anorexia. And then at other times, it was a little bit more orthorexia. So it kind of, it flows and it shifts but at the end of the day there's that feeling of just feeling powerless to your yeah to your own thoughts and like totally consumed by like I really could not for the life of me think about anything that wasn't food when I was um really in the in the depths of the anorexia both times I like every every waking thought was just like when am I going to eat next or like what am I going to eat next yep Totally, totally. That's how it was. Like I could not go on a vacation without spending hours upon hours researching what the restaurants were going to be, researching mm-hmm. what the menus were going to be at the location that I was going to. If I was going to a, a party or a wedding, I needed to know the menu. I had to know what was going to be the options. Yeah, I couldn't or even avoiding sit on the places. Couch. Like I would avoid places because yeah. I wasn't sure what was going to be there, and like I knew I I would only be allowed to eat this in my mm-hmm. head. So I, I wasn't going to run the risk of, you know, someone feeding me pizza or there only being pizza at a place. I was going to just stay home instead. Right, right. I skipped out on so many different functions. In one of my previous jobs, I actually had to plan the events at work like that, the potlucks and the different holiday parties and stuff. And I would intentionally schedule them when I had meetings or other uh, things going on so that I didn't have to attend because I didn't know what the food situation was going to be like. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things before we open it up, I'd, we'd love to invite some questions from the audience here. So if you want to go ahead and post in the chat or unmute yourselves, uh, definitely feel free to, to ask us some questions. One, one thing that I wanted to touch on really quick here is as far as the treatment, um, you, you brought up the good point that uh, you kind of needed a different approach to treatment because you needed to treat both the anorexia and the OCD simultaneously in order to keep one or the other kind of in, in line. So um, I'm curious, like what your thoughts are as far as treatment? Like, do you think at the end of the day, you were more treating the OCD or more treating the anorexia? Or do you think it was kind of like 50 um, 50? Like if one was maybe more codependent on the other? Yeah, it's uh, I'm gonna th- I'm thinking about the last kind of like episode that I had with anorexia. It's an interesting question because I so I've like done a lot of the bulk of my therapy in my life has been about OCD. Um, and like since I was 13, my OCD has kind of been it's been present. Um, and it's been like differing levels of impactful in my life. Um, and when I started restricting again, my OCD got a lot worse. Um, and I, I think that's common from what I understand. Um, but certainly mm-hmm. in my case, as I was eating less and less, like all the non food related rituals that I had, like washing my hands or showering in a certain way, those started to get a lot worse. Um, but I was restricting so much that like, I just ended up like, I, I was terribly bradycardic. I was, I was like dizzy every time that I stood up that when I went home to take my semester off, it was the, the focus was not on OCD. It was like, okay, let's, let's get this kid healthy. Let's mm-hmm. get him food and like, let's treat this, um, anorexia. And, and, um, I, I did a model of therapy called family-based therapy, which, um, I imagine a lot of people are familiar with. Um, yeah. and so like, because my parents were like basically my practitioners, um, they were just kind of like feeding me and we were just really focusing on that at first. Um, and what happened was as I started gaining more weight, it was almost as if my OCD like kind of calmed down by itself. I didn't really do anything to deliberately address it um, at first. Mm-hmm. 
but like just having more nutrients in my body, I guess, allowed my brain to filter those OCD thoughts a little better than it had been, um, which is pretty cool. And I don't know the neuroscience or psychology behind that, but that's just what it felt like. Um, yeah. And then as I, I started to be, like stabilize my weight, I found it easier to do exposures myself. Um, so it mm-hmm. felt like, to answer your question more directly, it felt like I was treating the anorexia and treating the anorexia and, and getting myself to a point where I was like physically healthy and my body was like ready to handle, I guess, anxiety. Um, mm-hmm. That allowed me to treat my OCD with more force. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's something that I didn't even really take into consideration in my own journey, but you're right. Um, as my body began to physically heal from uh, the state that the uh, eating disorder had left it in, I did notice that the OCD became more manageable. And I think a lot of it probably had to do with my brain, just getting the nutrients it needs again, or the the fact that I was sleeping better again at night and all those disruptions mm-hmm. that can just take a toll on your mental health in general. Uh, all of that was starting to kind of resolve itself, but um I'm I'm kind of the same way. I've noticed that it comes in waves. Like if the if I'm going through periods where the orthorexia is acting up, yeah, the other aspects of my life where OCD is present, it's usually I can see it a little bit more or I experience a little bit more. And when it, it subsides back down, it seems like the OCD kind of subsides back down too. So that's a an interesting mm-hmm. way to look at it. Yeah, it's just yeah. Like I, I feel like an increased need for control in every domain of my life when I feel it in one domain of my life. Yep, totally, totally. Uh, uh, control. Yeah, I'm surprised we made it this far without saying that the big old C word, because that's what a, a lot of it was for me was control, control, control. So uh, yeah, and the ironic thing is, we, we were never in control, like uh, the conditions yeah. fool you into believing that you're in control. So yeah, yeah all I, right. One th- or oh you- no, go ahead. There was just something in the chat, but go ahead and finish. Oh, your one thing that like I, I don't know, always like find it difficult to communicate to people who, um, who I talk to about eating disorders or OCD is like, I I I have some semblance of agency in this, but when I'm in the thick of the disorder, like I really don't feel like I have control. Like I, I I really needed my parents to help pull me out of all these anorexia thoughts, or I don't really know what have, would have happened to me because I was so lost and I, I felt like I had absolutely no agency in the matter um, that mm-hmm. I needed to rely on someone else. Um, yeah, so the lack of, yeah. I guess like the, I was trying to control everything in my world, but particularly the food. And I was trying so hard to control that I actually had absolutely no control over anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, truth of that. All right. So uh, Benjamin asked in the chat, uh, have either of us from our own experience or from peers, how have we handled the stigma associated with eating disorders in men? So that's an interesting uh, topic that I was thinking of heading into this today, that I feel like when it comes to advocating for OCD awareness, people don't give me as weird of a look with the, the fact that I'm a guy. But mm-hmm. if I go in there and I just talk about my eating disorder, they're like, oh, wait a minute, that can happen to men too? Like there is still such a stigma in the stereotype that exists around eating disorders. So uh, curious kind of how you've handled the, the stigma that comes with that. Um, yeah, I guess, I, I guess like the stigma comes up a lot for me when I talk about it with my friends um, because I took a semester off and because I'm just kind of an open person or I probably wouldn't be here if I weren't. Um, <laughs> I, I I spoke about my eating disorder with my friends and they kind of like, I don't know, they did like when when I spoke about my OCD, it was, they just didn't understand, didn't really understand it at first. And then, you know, when they started to understand it, they were like, okay, like whatever. Um, we love you anyways. But with Mm -hmm. the eating disorder, like they knew what an eating disorder was, but they always associated it with women. Um, so like, I didn't have to do as much explaining, but they were like, oh, like, why don't you just go to the gym and like get big or like like all my friends were trying to like bulk up and like have a bunch of muscles and they were like I don't get it Kyle like what what's wrong like we're yeah. all trying to get big um so I guess there was just a lot less understanding um when it came to my anorexia with my friends um mm-hmm. and then what I found like strange is I like 
I, I talk about OCD with everybody, but I, I find it a lot easier to talk about anorexia with women. I'm actually just realizing this when I'm talking to you now. I haven't really thought about this um, because like, I guess women just relate to it easier for in, in my experiences. They have whenever I talk about anorexia, they'll be like, oh, like I've had similar thoughts to that. And my male friends have never once kind of been like, oh, I've had similar thoughts to that. Right. And and the the thing is, and that's probably the stigma right there in action, because a lot of those male friends probably have had thoughts like that, but they don't yeah. say it. And that's what I run into all the time, especially with my guy friends, is that I know a lot of them are going through some of the same things I went through, but they just, they, there's that stigma. They don't talk about it as openly as my female friends do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, another question that we've got is, uh, were we nervous um, about gaining weight uh, in recovery? So um, I can take a flyer at that, that there was uh, some concern over over gaining weight. But at the same time, my body was at such a rock bottom physical level that I was actually kind of looking forward to gaining weight. And I think that kind of goes back to my condition in the first place with orthorexia, where I wasn't necessarily restricting for appearance or to, or to lose weight, but I was restricting to actually try to gain weight. Um, I was trying to bulk up just like Kyle mentioned uh, during your story. Uh, mm-hmm. I was trying to gain muscle and eat those healthy foods that I thought was going to give me that muscle. So for me, gaining weight didn't make me too nervous, but um, at the same time, it was not easy. It was a scary part of, of the recovery journey as well. So I don't know, Kyle, if, if you had something similar to that. Yeah, the first time that I, I struggled with any thoughts, I was trying to bulk up and then it became like I started losing a lot of weight and I started restricting. The second time, um, I feel like it was more like overtly about control and it was about like, let's see how much I can like, uh, th- this is sounds terrible, but this is kind of like I, what I identified as the underlying process was like, I wanted to see how much control I could exert over biology, like how much I could basically like <laughs> um, put my mind over matter. Um, and I did that by like trying to lose weight and and seeing how much like hunger I could tolerate. Um, so to that extent, like when I had to start gaining weight, yeah, I was terribly nervous um, or n- not even terribly nervous, just like reluctant because that just wasn't what I was trying to do. That felt like the opposite of what my disorder was yelling at me to do. Um, so I, yeah, I was nervous, but I also knew like Jason kind of alluded to that, like I was my, my body needed it. Like I was at such a physical low that like, I understood intellectually that like, this is like, I need this. I, I want to be eating right now. Um, and even if I gain weight, like, so what I, I, I just need to be healthy again. Um, and then as I started gaining weight, I realized that my anorexia was really lying to me. And that like, if you have one chocolate bar, you don't gain 45 pounds all of a sudden, like you had a chocolate bar. Okay. Right. <laughs> it's a part of your day. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's learning to the your diet is not defined by just that one meal that your mind is trying to tell you is the make or break thing. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So uh, Maria asked if uh, either one of us was put into the hospital due to the bricardia. Um, I was not. I was monitored outpatient. My doctor, I had to check in every week with my doctor um, to monitor my heart and uh, my overall condition. But I was not hospitalized. Kyle, were you hospitalized? Uh, no, I also wasn't hospitalized. I definitely did a lot of outpatient check-ins. Um, mm-hmm. when I was at a really low weight, I, I would go pretty often. Um, and I did, I guess an IOP. Um, and for that, like we had to do like a medical check-in, um, but I never uh, was hospitalized for it specifically. Yeah. All right. Next question here is, um, how did you find the motivation to do the OCD work? My daughter is anorex- has anorexia and OCD uh, when she is anxious about food. The OCD behaviors around germs and hand washing get stronger and she can't resist it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not a clinician, so I'll just speak from like what my experience was. Um, my experience was just I, I focused really hard on eating first um and getting that under control to the extent that like I I felt like I had energy and I was vibrant enough to go and tackle the OCD when I was at my lowest weight wise and I really I was just starving all the time like 
I knew that I should be resisting the urge to wash my hands and all that, but I just couldn't get myself to do it. I just didn't have the energy. Um, so I focused on the AN first and then went um, and tackled the OCD. Um, but I did that with a, a really long like history of being in OCD therapy and like knowing what strategies I could use to regulate my own anxiety with doing an exposure in an OCD treatment. Um, so that sort of context might have made my particular strategy a little, uh, I guess, easier. So I don't want to try to generalize anything, but that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for me, one of the things that I also did was I made a list early on of all the things that my OCD and my eating disorder had stole from me, or it was taking away from my life. So whether it was those events that we were talking about, or being able to go on vacation, or to be able to spend time with loved ones and not have those obsessive thoughts can consume my mind all the time. So I made that list. And if anything, that list made me angry. So I kind of got mad at the OCD, I got mad at the orthorexia. And that gave me that motivation to, to help do the work. So as I was, I would kind of approach every therapy session or every appointment as like training that I was uh, training myself to prepare for like this ultimate battle with my eating disorder and my OCD. So yeah, um, yeah it looks like Emma, yeah, that we're about to log out here. So um, we will go ahead. Priscilla had one question that we didn't get to this time, but we will send out an email afterwards with the, with the, um, recording. And we will also answer Priscilla's uh, question in there about what advice you'd have to give to folks in recovery who are doing it on their own. So um, yeah, we will, we thank everybody for joining us. Kyle, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've hit the max here. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we will uh, send out an email soon and uh, take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.